as the world begins to emerge from the cave of the 21st century and opens its eyes onto the suffering from centuries of injustice and the bastardization of what it means to be free, the new Nomos podcast is a call. A call for a new beginning. A call for the new men and the new women that yearn to be truly free. A call for us to fulfill our destiny. A call for a new Nomos on the earth. Welcome to the New Nomos Podcast. I'm Abdallah Dutton, inviting you to join me on this journey of discovery to define what the New Nomos is and what we need to get there. And we're back in action after a little hiatus for the end of Ramadan and a period of regrouping and strategizing the way forward for the podcast. I've been working on some interesting things that I am so excited to share. It's coming together and with all that's been happening, it feels great to be introducing another episode. Now, just before Ramadan, I was introduced to Muhammad Al-Khatib while having lunch at a restaurant in Cape Town. And afterwards, we proceeded to have a coffee and we were chatting and chatting and chatting and I realized this is an interesting man with an interesting story and somebody that I wanted to interview and draw out insights and experiences from his life. So we set a time during Ramadan and this episode is what came out of it. It covers snippets from Muhammad's life, from my life, ups and downs, experiences from our various entrepreneurial endeavors, our childhoods, our ancestry, education, migration, nomadism, business, mentorship, dreams, psychology, states, the list goes on. It's a conversation that moves and flows and to really get the most out of it, it needs to be listened to from the start to the end. So, without further ado, I present to you Episode 31, From Cents to Dollars, Forced Migration to Nomadism. The story is, is that I was at university doing maths and statistics, trying to understand why I'm doing maths and statistics. And my dad was a professor uh, at the same uni, um, really super smart, one of four experts globally only in power systems and engineering, um, getting paid a very modest amount of money. And I just see a lot of people around me, very well educated, very smart, not earning much money. And I'm seeing like plumbers and, and uh, butchers turning up in Mercedes cars. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, there's something wrong with the system. The system's not right. So when I graduate, I was like, there's no way I'm going to go and be an accountant. That's crazy. I need to earn a lot of money. I want to earn a lot of money. I want to do things with my money. So it's not just money for the sake of it. Yeah. I was like, I really want to help people, be a benefit to society, community, do stuff. You know what I mean? I want to be big. So I was like, okay, I need to get into sales. So I did a sales course for free. And then I basically saw an ad in the paper um, which said sales and management, whatever, graduate course or something, 25K a year. This is in the early 90s, right? Sorry, late 90s. So I was like, okay, that sounds brilliant. 25 grand, you know, sterling, yeah? Um, so I turned up and... Um, they were, they basically said, right, we're going to sell perfume. We're going to sell perfume. And um, they started explaining about the, perf- the world of perfume, right? And everyone, okay, cool. First day, fine, we understand perfume, right? Okay, and then the next day, they said, okay, we'll put you on a fast track scheme, which we'll tell you what that is at the end of the week. But what you need to do is go and, um, and sell these bottles to your friends and family. They said the, the, the scam basically is, um, we get the perfume from the same factory that everyone else gets it from, but put it in our own in our own bottles. So it's exactly the same thing, just packaged in a different bottle. We sell it for 20 quid instead of 80 quid in the shop. So that's like, they said, okay, so go sell it to your friends and family. Whoever sells the most, so we put them in a fast track. 
So you've got 10 or 15 people that have responded to this ad, right? They all come and literally they come back the next day having sold 15 or 20 bottles at 20 quid a hit, right? To their friends and family, okay? And they're like, okay, what's the fast track? Okay, right. Anyway, let's tell you about how we're going to sell. It's door to door, cold calling, in the cold, in the winter, in England, Oy. right? And you sell a bottle for 20 quid and you get 10 pounds commission, right? So literally everyone leaves. They literally get up and leave. Because no one's like, what do you mean? This is a sales management training course. This is just a scam. It's a pyramid scam. Because mm-hmm. the fast track is if you sell um, whatever, 100 bottles, then you get to recruit people under you and then you get commission from their sales. Right, right, it's right, a right. pyramid scheme. Yeah. Right? But I was one of the crazy ones. I was like, okay, cool, I'll do it. <laughs> right? And I actually broke records, alhamdulillah, by God's grace. Um, I, I sold 100 bottles in three and a half weeks. But this was the start of understanding a key lesson of working smart, not just working hard, right? Mm. So on a little tour of uh, England, I went to Oxford and there was a kebab shop, a kebab truck, food truck, yeah. right? And um, I made friends with them. They're Turkish. I said, okay, look, I'm going to give you a cut of the, of, the, of the perfume sales, but I want to put the perfume bottles up here. When all the ladies come before and after they go out, okay, we try and sell them the perfume. And I'm going to give you a cut. Boom, 30 bottles sold one night. Oh, wow. Right? And then I had, um, obviously, a big football fan. So I had a few uh, friends of mine that um, were um, part of, you know, football teams that were Sunday league teams. And I said, look, Christmas is coming up. Let's do a promo. Buy one, get one free, whatever it was. And sell it to, you know, all the team. And I'll give you a cut as well. Boom, sold the other, like, 50 or whatever. And then did some cold calling. You've got to learn the trade. So knocking on doors, got chased by people, chased by dogs. You know, had to get maybe 19 no's until you get a yes, yeah. right? So it builds your character, toughens your skin, but you get a reward at the end of it. So, yeah, and that was my in- entry into, into sales. What was driving you? <sighs> oh, man, loads of stuff, loads of stuff. Because, um, I mean, if you're getting 19 no's to the one yes, it's like, what's the, what was that force behind you? Because that's what... I- so uh, there's a lot of things that people... Um, Ask me about about my personality or or I reflect about you know really successful salespeople that have worked for me. There are things that are intangible in my view they're 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 just instilled in you from God God instills them in you and you, you don't know why. I can tell you some worldly things that I think contribute okay so we had a we had a really really good upbringing like quite a privileged upbringing went to one of the best schools in the world went to school in Abu Dhabi when I was younger. Before then, I was in a private school up until the age of six in, in England, right? But then when we came back from Abu Dhabi around the age of 13, I went to like a normal school. Money was a bit tight. Mm. Okay, I had loads of issues, bullying, racism, you name it, all the issues you could have. I had it at school and we financially, we didn't earn anywhere near my, what my dad was earning um, in Abu Dhabi, mm. right? So I saw like two sides and I guess that must have for sure motivated me to to try and get back to those levels that my dad was at um but also when you just look around you and all you see is you know poverty depression oppression um and i look at one's role in life which you know according to my islamic understanding of also is to be a benefit to others and to do good in in the community and society if i just go and get a normal crappy job and i just about survive or even go into debt as most people are now that's not really earning value so I was like, no, no, I need to earn a lot of money. And then with that money, I can do stuff. I can really support people. So those, I think, are the, the two things. But I'm naturally competitive. Bro. Okay. I'm just naturally, like, I have to excel at whatever I do. It's not necessarily about the reward. Like, when I was in, in, in a lot of my sales jobs, seeing my name at the top of the league table, that was, that was key. <laughs> Even though I'm going to earn a lot of money from this. No, but it's the recognition and being seen as the top or you know whatever top five percent whatever it is that that was a big big driver and and when they they bring you up and give you an award and they tell you you know you've done you've done good sam in front mm. of people that just it drives me massive amazing amazing so you were able to with all the no's and everything just keep smashing through yeah to get that number one spot <laughs> yeah but i tell you what a lot of that comes down to as well is massive insecurity so I'm not, I don't think, you know, I, well, 
I've probably got a degree of arrogance as we all do when we try and manage it, right? But I'm actually very, very insecure. All the bullying, all the racism, all these things that I got at school mm. completely killed my confidence, right? So when I got into sales, because it's in almost instantly tangible results, right? Okay? Yeah. It's not even sales where it's like a 10 month sales cycle. No, it's literally instant. Here you go, I've got a bottle of perfume. You want it? Yes, okay, cool. That buzz. Ting. Yeah, that yeah. tangibility. Right. And then when you and in sales, we say people buy people. OK, so not, they're not buying a product. They're buying you. That's why if you go and want to buy a, the same phone from a shop, but you go to four different shops, what made you buy from that one shop? It's the person. So you say, same phone, probably same price. OK, but it's that one person you buy from, you bought him. People mm. buy people. Right. So it totally gives you, I don't know, self-worth, I guess, and just confidence. They said yes to me. And then when you do it regularly, so in sales, you have something called, you know, close rates. So how many people, you know, what's your percentage close rates? And at my peak, I was like almost one to one, almost one to one. So it, for my confidence levels, it's like crazy. And I've ended up becoming really good friends with a lot of people I sold to. So, you know, again, it shows, you know, people buy people. Till this day, a lot of my clients now, my businesses now, have been with me for like 12, 13 years. Mm. And with their, with their mates of mine. Do you think it's connected, your need to be recognized as the number one spot? Do you think that's connected to your father needing to be, or the fa or your father being the number one engineer? Um, maybe subconsciously. Because my dad was really rated. Like, he was massively respected. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you know, we traveled the world with him when he'd go to conferences. You know, in 1985 when I was 10, we went to Disneyland and Disney World because he had like conferences all over America. Oh, well. Right? Yeah, <laughs> one trip, right? So he obviously had a level of, of respect. And I think with your father, a lot of people, whether they consciously or subconsciously um, know it, you try and aspire to be at least like your dad. Maybe it's, it's something subconscious. Not, I'm not yeah, aware yeah, of it. No, it was just something that I heard. Because you mentioned that right at the beginning, your father was like the leader of his field. Mm. And like one thing that gave you drive was this like being recognized yeah. as the leader in your field. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. But, but also my mum, bro. My mum mm. was the top of, she was a pharmacist and she was the top of her class, top of her country she, in, in Egypt. She was the number one student in pharmacy on, in the whole country. Wow. Right. Yeah, not, not a joke. And she was a, a senior manager at Smith Klein Beecham in the 80s. She was a proper, she was a serious lady. No, no joke. So how did you end up in the UK? So basically, my granddad was, again, a big player. So, you know, I, I, this is none to do with me. I didn't choose this, but I have a good family. I come from almost an aristocratic family in Egypt. Amazing. Right? Yeah, and we're, they're big doctors. They have a hospital in our name and so on, right? And my granddad, my dad's dad, um, he was connected. So, so, okay, so if you're really successful in Egypt, you, you're also a professor or a lecturer at the university. As well as your day job, you also, you know, lecture at uni, okay. right? So he was connected somehow to the student union. And then um, the, the president at the time was basically just clearing up various people, imprisoning them, whatever. And... Those people that they imprisoned, they would look in their diaries and, you know, their contact books. And whoever else is in their contacts, they'd sweep up. Mm. They swept up my granddad, took his businesses away, um, exiled him. He had a heart attack in Libya and then died there. And pe pe like only my grandma was allowed to see him or something like that. Wow. So my dad was like well distressed with this. Mm. Okay? Um, it's funny you mentioned my dad now because there's some other things I haven't even told you about my dad. So my dad was also... Um, part of a band he was the lead of a band that were the first um, people to bring in western music into Egypt okay western music into yeah. Egypt so they would play okay. like Beatles songs or whatever oh cool right and he taught this guy called Omar Khairat like if you look him up he's the biggest composer in the Middle East like ever any music for films he is the guy oh wow right my dad taught him how to play the drums or whatever it was I can't remember um, and he was part of his group. So he's like his apprentice almost, mm. right? And he played handball for, I think he got to national level. And he was Young Musician of the Year five years in a row in Egypt, played the piano. 
Okay. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of things. Anyway, so my, <laughs> <laughs> crazy, yeah? Huh? Right? So maybe, again, you know, you know, all these things subconscious, right? Things you have to live up to. So he, um, he got a scholarship and went to uni in, or to do his master's in England in the early 70s. And him and my mum are second cousins, right? He's very good friends with her brothers as well. So the two brothers went with my dad to England. And again, you know, same stories, right? They, they're working in kitchens, working in petrol stations. These are people that have come from villas and maids and drivers that leave their home for a better life for them and for their families, for their, for their future. And they go and literally there's no ego. This is no joke. This is, I've got no money. I've got no Skype got no WhatsApp, right? I'm on my own with virtually no money in London. I need a kitchen, get me any job. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm there. Wow. Right? So him and the two brothers. Okay. And then my mum wanted to do her master's. So she joined up with the brothers. And then basically, so my dad just married her. And that's how, how that all started. Yeah. But again, for my mum, you know what I mean? She was like a princess. She was the, the eldest of five, the top girl, spoilt, blah, 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 blah. So again, for her, she goes from that to, okay, my husband, he doesn't come home because after his uni, he goes to the petrol station to, to earn us money so we can just have some food next day. Wow. So when they go through that, for us, you've got to represent it. And after yeah, that, you've got to represent. You yeah. can't be like doing nothing. Look at what they've gone through. Amazing, yeah. Wow, so well, that was all that was all politically motivated in Egypt, yes. and that was the seventies. Yeah, who was who was the president? Abdel Nasser. That was Nasser. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Amazing. these things, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's it's, it's fascinating because you like you know little bits of the history, but you don't know the story of the person on the ground. Yeah, and when you hear the story of the person on the ground, you realize it's like wow. Because even like I mean, you're saying this and. It's reminding me of my grandmother, so my mother's mother, telling me of how they left India. Mm. And her her family was a very significant uh, landed family mm. in the north of India. Mm. I mean, she came from significant wealth. Yeah. And with partition, her mother took as much of the uh, gold and jewels she could carry in her sari and they and they escaped India with that, wow. and that's what they used to buy their house in Pakistan. Wow. And then you know she married my grandfather, and then they moved to the United Kingdom, and they literally mm. came with nothing, and mm. they had to mm. hustle their way through, mm. you know, to to create something. And I remember my grandfather always telling me, "Is I came to this country with only five pounds, <laughs> you know?" <laughs> and it was, but he did. Yeah, exactly. Huh? And when he died, he was worth I don't know what. I mean, he had shares. He bought shares in Boots. The mm. kind of the the high street pharmacy mm. just before it took off because he just he saw that like th this thing had potential so he you know bought a load of stock of boots he was like properly into his shares and he loved the, the whole yeah. thing yeah i just remember him he was always sitting there he had these really thick glasses and like on the one side had a magnifying glass so he was like <laughs> basically blind in the one eye right. and he'd sit like a meter away from the television on teletext, just okay, going yeah. through all the shares and checking everything was what, what yeah. was going on. Fascinating. Yeah, brilliant, man. So, from selling perfume on the street, what happened next? How did you, like, I mean, you obviously made, you're making some decent cash. Um, so, I got into selling advertising space, which is one of the hardest things that you can do by telephone, cold calling. That like, was super difficult to global corporates. Like you're talking, you're calling KPMG and people that cold call trying to sell a page of advertising for 10 grand or whatever a hit. This is in magazines? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, that was really tough as well. Did okay, it didn't excel. And then I was trying to get one of my best mates to come and work for me, uh, to come work with me. Um, so he was looking for jobs. And then he says, I've got this job in telecoms. Right, you got to apply as well. I was like, okay, cool. So um, he didn't really tell me anything about it, as if he was hiding something. So I applied and I turned up for the interview, and um, in central London, and they ripped up my CV, and I said, listen, we're not interested in this. 
you tell us about Mo. I was like, all right, cool, tell them about Mo. I said, okay, cool. Um, we like you, but here's how things work with us. In order to get the, um, the job, you need to come to a 48-hour assessment weekend in Yeovil. You know where Yeovil is? The Oval Yeovil. ground. No, no, Yeovil. Yeovil? Yeah. No, yeah. where's Yeovil? Exactly, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> so on the west, um, west, west part of England, farmland, like in uh, Salisbury or whatever. Okay? So they basically have a call centre in the middle of a farm in Yeovil. And you turned up for the assessment centre with like 15 other people. And there's 12 exercises you've got to do um, for, to, to get through to the next phase. The next phase is a residential in-house sales training boot camp. Okay? Um, and after you pass that, if you get past that, there's an assessment weekend by a company called Cable & Wireless, who at the time one of the biggest telecoms companies in the world, right now owned by Vodafone, okay? And you would basically be on a 30 grand basic, 30 grand commission, BMW, mobile phone, laptop. This is in the late 90s. Right. And this is mainly young people, mm. right? like just fresh graduates pretty much. So that's a massive opportunity, okay? So what they do is they do this assessment center where they test most of your soft skills, okay? And they want to see your desire to succeed. And they want to see you overcome fears. So for example, we had to do an army obstacle course. Mm. Within that, you have to climb a 50-foot tree with a safety harness, right? Mm. And, then, and then walk a tightrope, right? So you've got a fear of heights. You've got a problem. Like yeah. Some people didn't do it, yeah, yeah. okay? Obviously, they didn't make it. The people that went up and just did it and it wasn't a problem, that was just a tick in the box. But the people that were crapping themselves, but did it, they get two or three ticks. Mm. They're like, okay. You know what I'm saying? Right? So um, there was an army obstacle course. There was an orienteering exercise. Yeah. Okay? There was a, a, a night walk, which is crazy. So go into the forest. They put you in teams of like six or whatever. And there's a rope about waist height that you have to follow. Okay? But with a, at night. So it's in the forest. So it, it, there's trees and rocks and all sorts of obstacles. And what they would do is the person at the front wears a blindfold. And then he has five people behind him who can see, right? And then the person at the front, he has to lead and he has to communicate what he's going through so the other people behind him avoid the same, the same issue. You do that for two minutes and then you go to the back of the queue and then they see how you interact as a team. As Fascinating. A team yeah, man, yeah. no, brilliant. They had this thing called a balloon debate, right? So you, they, they, the scenario is that there's four of you in a, in a balloon and, um, and there's a problem. So three of you are going to have to get thrown out and only one stays um, so that the balloon survives. And you have to basically give a five minute, you have to choose a character and then give a five minute talk as to why you shouldn't be the one to be thrown out. And okay. You, you, you do it not only to the people that are in your group, but the whole boot camp, there's like a hundred people and they vote, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a fear of public speaking, whatever it is, boom, again. So if you imagine the type of people that they picked, mm. right? Like phenomenal. So they would then go on to do the boot camp, right? And then go on to get the job. Now I'm in touch with most of the people that were on my particular cycle. If I look, on, look them up on LinkedIn now, it is phenomenal. They're all owners of businesses, multiple businesses, senior people in the telecoms and IT world, no joke. It just goes to show the recruitment process is like phenomenal. You get that right, you'll succeed. Mm. And the same with Liverpool right now, Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I went through the boot camp. So I got through the assessment center, got through the boot camp and got the job with, the, with an American corporate. So that was me in corporate sales, right? Um, in central London at the age of whatever, 24. And this was me almost like going from hood to corporate. Yeah. Right. So when I went, turn up to that interview for the, for the, the, the boot camp, I was wearing a beret and I had like a, a funky beard. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was wearing a bandana or something. I mean, <laughs> my hip hop influence. Right. Um, and then two, three years later, 
you know, I'm shopping in Savile Row, buying Oswald Burton tailored suits, mm. right? So it was a bit of a turnaround um, and tasted, tasted money really for the first time. How did that adult. feel at that point oh, in your life? Incredible. Mm. Incredible. I mean, that was, those are some of the best times in my life. How long did that last? Um, about six years until I went into the world of owning your own business, which is just a massive, massive roller coaster journey. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, six years of good life. Like in 2000 and 2001, I went away 36 times. Literally went out to Barcelona or. On holiday? Yeah. Or just like. Yeah, yeah, holiday because. I was basically doing my quarter's target in like day two of the quarter. And I'm like, okay, see you later. I'll just go. No, no one bother me, please. I've done target. Everyone's happy. For the quarter, not even for the month, for the quarter. And I'll just Whoa. go. Yeah, yeah. Earning, you know, over 100 grand a year. And so what, then you just got bored of it and left? No, no, I didn't get bored. So I, um, basically, I was doing the selling bit really, really well. And then they were upping their recruitment. Um, so... I um I wanted to become a manager, you know, natural sort of progression, and I love helping people, and I get m more of a buzz when I train someone, and then see them sell than I do when I sell. So mm. I naturally fit management. Um, so I became a manager, and then and then I was like, well, well, well hold on. Yes, I'm earning good money, but the peop the shareholders and the owners up top, they are earning like billions, millions, whatever. Like, so I'm in the wrong job. So I can't just be a salesperson or a sales manager. This ain't this this is not what it's about. So I was like, okay, the top people in the world they basically own their own businesses, and they're in charge a bit more of their lifestyle as well. So that's what I want to do. But um, a key thing, and you'll see a theme here, right? So I don't just jump into things and hope for the best. I went and I studied sales. I did a sales course before doing the perfume stuff, mm. right? I go to a boot camp to learn how to sell. Okay? Mm. We didn't really talk about that, but there literally you wake up six in the morning, go for a run, come back, do a sales class, um, and then have breakfast and then sell real time over the phone. Mm. Right? And then come back, lunch, more selling, um, more classes, telephone role plays, video role plays, killer video role plays. Like you pretend to be the, the, the salesperson, the, someone's the, the, the client, and you're videoed and your your mentor is in front of you looking at you and looking at the video and then you have to go through assessments where they, then they bring all your peers and then you watch the video and they critique the video in front of you wow some people cried and left yeah like left the whole camp yeah of course yeah. right that like, you can't humiliate me like this right but i was like no nah, man you know you got to do what you got to do so um so um i looked at the stats and you know most businesses fail in the first year. So like, yeah, well, clearly, I mean, you, I mean, you got to, why would I just, I can't just become a, a doctor tomorrow or a butcher. There's got to be an apprenticeship and a training. So I tried to find a job where um, I get as close to running my own business as possible, but under some sort of me uh, mentoring or guidance. Mm -hmm. right? So enter a guy called John Caldwell. You know, remember the Phones for You stores? Phones for you, yeah, yeah. yeah, vaguely. It rings a bell. Right, so basically John Caldwell started selling mobile phones off the back of a lorry in the 80s. Made a massive amount of money and then owned 20 companies. He, is, he was the biggest mobile phone distributor in Europe. So most phones that you had in your hand in yeah, Europe. Yeah, I think I watched a, a documentary about yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's like one of like big, big, big billionaire yes. based in London, bought yes. one of these mad houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's him, right? Um, and what he did was, is when people came in in a management position, um, they would basically submit a profit and loss business plan, right? Whereas most that traditional sales management, you just have a target and you just meet the target of revenue. No one cares about the profit and you're not responsible for anything. You just recruit the salespeople and deliver a number, mm. right? Now here, it's like, no, you've got to go and get your own office. Here's the budget. So you, you, you build a plan, right, under guidance. You build a plan, and then you're targeted against delivering the revenue number and the profit figure. 
right? And then you get paid into that. So it's like having your own business, but without worrying about the cash flow. Because if you somehow run out of money, mm. they're, they'll still top you up. Yeah. Okay. So it's not quite, and the cash flow is the most critical thing in a business, right? But um, you get all the other experience. Right. Okay. So I went and did that. And again, they had recruited some people who were my managers, um, all overqualified to do the job. So they, they wanted to build like a whole um, mobile corporate division, okay? Um, which they eventually sold for like 400 million pounds <laughs> yeah. to Vodafone, okay? But the strategy was, let's get the best in class from the, other, from the American corporates, okay? Put them in, over-engineer them, and then get them to succeed and then promote really, really quickly. Yeah. So it's what called, they call a meritocracy, right? And it had a big, big hire and fire culture as well. Okay? So most people hated that. I loved it. Because right? Right. I had issue before when I was at, at um, what's called Ryzen now. It's called Wellcom back in the days. Yeah. Whereas I'm, I'm in a sales team and I'm delivering. I'm overperforming even. right? But half the team isn't. And they're getting put in what they call the disciplinary procedure. Or like the magic program or whatever. So they spend six months trying to get them to succeed. And then they put on a, on a warning, whatever. It's like a year before you get them out. Right. And this person has now hurt our chances of the team succeeding, right? So I just didn't like that. It's just too long a process. Yeah. Okay. Whereas there, I walked in and then they have um, like 26-year-old MDs. You remember, they've got these 20 companies, right? Some of them are run by 26-year-olds who just joined like two years ago, mm. right? So it's a complete meritorious. If you're good, they promote. Boom, not a problem. Right. So, and then if you're crap, basically they got rid of you within a month. Yeah. Okay. So really, really high churn rates, but paid a massive amount of money. Yeah. Okay. And I went in and I got promoted like three times within a year. Right. I was earning the most I've ever earned, and there was no slack. That it literally people, if you come in month, you haven't delivered, you're out. Yeah. Okay. But very, very stressful. Very, very high pressure. One of the big reasons I had my first divorce. Mm. Right. Um. But I love the environment and I learned how to manage a business. Um, and then I formed a, uh, um, a company with one of the other managers who run businesses before. Um, that's how I got into my first company from there. Which was doing what? Um, same thing, actually. We were just doing it by ourselves. So we, we formed a little um, telecoms broker, in essence, a little telecoms reseller, selling exactly the same thing we were selling in the company. But we actually did it. Uh, as um, like a third party for the same company, but we were just on our own. We weren't working for them, mm, okay. and then we expanded like from there and stuff. But the the mentoring thing is a thing that's missing in a lot of people's lives, and for me, it's a really, really critical thing. That I really encourage people to to have multiple mentors mm. and get new ones. Because you, you shouldn't just have one, in my view, like for, you know, for your whole lifetime. You should get what you can out of that person and then move on and have different ones. You know, one for work, one for spiritual, one for fitness. Probably if I was going to say, like, what's the one main reason you've had success in your life? Mentals. Fact. And if you think about all the films we grew up watching back in the days, I don't know if you were into martial arts, like all the old kung fu films. Well, I like the, the, the what, Jet Li, but the, the Bruce Lee ones. Yeah, okay. But in the Bruce Lee, you didn't really see so much that storyline, but the Jet Li, old Jet Li stuff, you know, the whole, like, uh, the Shaolin monk, whatever, and he, yeah, he's yeah, searching yeah. for the master yeah. of that particular technique or whatever, mm. right? So that, that mentality, you know, searching for that person that's going to elevate you to the next level or teach you that piece of skill that you've not been able to develop with anyone else or you've heard about this master that did amazing things yeah. so you go to him you know mm. you proactively go to him yeah right so not just uh, let's hope they come to me you know i'm looking no 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 search yeah you gotta search for it go on the journey yeah mm. leave country if you need to is that what started your nomadism <laughs> <laughs> um no that's a probably to do with like bad weather in england yeah? Mm. Um, now, the, if we're going to sort of go on to that. So basically, I'd been in London, this is what, so till, say till 2009 or something now. Bad weather, 
grumpy people in my view. Um, and I was just asking myself, what are we doing all of this for? Because even people that are wealthy in England, there's no work-life balance, mm. right? It's really expensive, like the standard of living is well, well priced. So even if you earn a lot of money, you're paying a lot of tax, right? And, um, and you go to work before the sun is out and you come back and the sun's down, you don't see the light. Like, why are we, why are we doing all this? I mean, what, where's the joy in life, yeah. right? Because even if you've got money, you're doing whatever you need. You know, it's raining most of the time, right? You can't go out, you know. So what, why, that was just is the big why question, right? Why are we doing all this? So I decided that I wanted to um, start a business that I could eventually run remotely. Then our internet started taking off and, you know, remote working or home working is a thing now. So I actually specifically set myself, you know, a goal that I'm going to get my company to reach a certain threshold of profit that can then enable me to leave the country and live a much better lifestyle with the same amount of money, right? And I can run it remotely and that I don't have to work every day. Yeah. So again, one of the things I learned at the boot camp is goal setting and one of the most important books that i've ever read stephen covey seven habits of highly effective people massively recommend that book to anyone i come across okay um you know the habits are begin with the end in mind one of them right you've got to know you've got to set goals you've got to set targets Mm. and go and deliver right so i set that target and um Around 2012, I got my second divorce, and my mum had been alone now for 10 years because dad passed away in 2001, whatever. So I was like, you know what? I need to go and spend some time with mum, and let me see if I can basically work from work from Egypt, because I'd set up my telecoms and IT business. I could run it remotely, mm. had everything in control. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm just gonna. I'm going to go and spend some time with mum. So that was the first, the first step. Everything was cool. I was working two hours a day by the swimming pool in the sun, meeting all my family members. I mean, just having a wicked time. And very different, very different to before all the going out to Barcelona and extravagance and mm. buying clothes and driving nice cars and whatever, all that stuff. Done that, been there. Okay, fine. You know. Got the buzz out of that, but that's not what it's about anymore. So then it was about meeting people. Um, and then I'm seeing how, because you're from England, they respect you without even knowing you, right? They're like, they have an appreciation of what y- your education, your culture, everything, right? And then I suddenly see, saw how I could be an example to people. I could be a driver, a motivator, not because I'm personally brilliant, but just generically what, what, what I've done and what my parents did with me, okay, is a f- good formula for other people to, to follow, right? So if they want to, you know, my cousins want to take their kids out and go to, to England or whatever, mm. they see me as a, a, a potential model for them to follow. Right. Can I stress, it's not that I'm brilliant or I'm better than anyone else, it's just the model. Because yeah. anything good that I've done has come from God, so I don't, like, I didn't choose it, it's just this is what God chose for me, so... Fine. And then some other business opportunities came along and um, it involved a lot of traveling. And I love photography. I love traveling. I love food. I love meeting people. Right. So I was like, okay, so why don't I kind of have a base in Egypt? So I'll make sure I come back and see mum, you know, three, three, four months of the year. Mm. Um, I'll go back to England, back to base there. I've still got my house there and it's rented out and so on. Right and my businesses and clients there. Um, started another business in America. So I was just bouncing around um, with those three bases. But then in addition, I had the business in America is around farming. So we have farms all over the world that we, we buy from. So instead of just jumping in to the farm for like two days and then coming back, I was like, no, no, we'll actually spend three months in that, in that region. Mm. In that city, you go and visit the farm, yeah, but then come back to a base. Um, and that's basically how I kind of live, 
live my life. It sounds like a dream. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it sounds sexy and it is on the whole, but it's not so straightforward. But let's just break some of it down. So there's some big, big things that allow you to be a digital nomad, even with not that much money. Airbnb, massive thing. Okay, and I give a big tip for everyone. So um, <laughs> if you can do this, um, don't book the Airbnb until a day or two before you need to get it. Yeah. And then in essence, contact a load of landlords and ask for a 40, 50, 60% discount on, on, on the place. Because at the end of the day, very few people are going to go and get an Airbnb with one day to go. So they might as well fill up the place and not have it. So most Airbnbs I stay in, I've stayed in for like 50, 60% discount. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First thing. Second thing, um, Uber. Uber, big game changer. You know, you think about traveling, one of the main things that you're even worried about from day one is when, you know, you arrive, how are you going to get to where you're getting to? Especially now, you're not staying in a hotel. There's not, it's not an airport shuttle. Mm -hmm. So one of the first negative experiences we would get when we travel is the first skank, the first robbery from the taxi driver yeah. at the airport, right? So they don't have that problem. You know, <laughs> just get an Uber, right? And then also, you know, to keep your cost down, normally you would try and get on a train or a bus or whatever, yeah? But now you're just getting an Uber, yeah. right? So it massively changed the game, the, the second thing. Third thing is um, Google Maps, restaurant reviews, or apps like Yelp, right? Because eating is a big, big part of your, uh, your trip, right? And especially, not just touristically, but a lot of people have, you know, specific eating habits. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Muslim, you need halal food, right? right? Um, or, you know, and this angers me, right? But often when you go abroad, you go to the Chinese area, for example, Chinatown, and it's all Chinese people eating there. Like, why have you traveled to go and uh, eat your own food? Like, <laughs> no, go and tell But anyway, that's how people are. Right? Yeah. So, you know, so now that you can find exactly the restaurant that you want, the type you want, you can see the reviews, you can see the photos, is a massive game changer. Massive game changer. Right? And then all the different things on Airbnb now, you have, you know, experiences so you can get tour guides, you know, local tour guides, normal people that can show you around, right? So the convenience now, um, the amount of information you have, the planning you can do, it's just phenomenal. Those three things, Airbnb, Uber, and, and, and Google. But you see, now I'm interested about this, that you're, because I know your business is looking at single source yeah. food products, right? Yes. That's your current business. Yeah, one of them, yeah. And I like that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you don't want to be have all your eggs in one basket, man. That's that's the worst thing you can do. Multiple income streams. Absolutely, big time. However small, but diverse. COVID, man. COVID just killed most of my businesses. But if I didn't have so many so many different things, I you know it's like the total of them made me survive. So you say like loads. Yeah. What what number are you are you doing thirties fifties tens? Well, no, I mean whatever you can your your financial capabilities are, but you don't don't have one. Let's that's the starting point. Don't just have one, mm. right? And then as you save money and build your your life, you know, from a young age, you need to get more and more um, different revenue streams, however small. Because if you were to put a hundred pounds or dollars in Bitcoin ten years ago. Mm. Was that six times? That'd be like, I don't know, 6,000, 10,000 right now? I don't know, something like that. How, however small, it could have bought a reward, mm -hmm. right? So whatever your financial means are and whatever country you're in and what currency you have, all these different things. But diversity, right? Have some money in gold. Have some money in, in real estate. Well, you can't afford to buy a whole house yourself. No problem. Get 10 friends and do it, mm. right? And get money from, from the rent, okay? Invest in, in shares. Invest in some long-term things and some short-term things. Invest in some things that are going to get you very low growth, but it's almost guaranteed. But also look at some, some startups. Look at some crowdfunding. That's, and crowdfunding. That's, all, that's all kind of relatively passive income. Yeah, yeah, most of it, yeah. Right, it, and then your actual kind of what you're grinding on? Yeah, well, that's, that's, um, that's mainly my income. 
But I was able to get involved with them because of the things I did before. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So yeah, you now you that... had multiple businesses. Yeah. So that's like multiple income streams from things that you're directly working on. Yeah. But that I could imagine. Uh, I mean, you're saying don't put all your eggs in one basket, but also if you have multiple things that you're working on, is that not a distraction? Are you not being overstretched? Or could you not be kind of okay. distracted from what you're doing? No, absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. But you got to remember the journey, mm. right? So I didn't tell you I, w- I finished uni and then I suddenly had like 10 businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I've built a career which involves building knowledge, expertise, know-how, and to be successful, there are many soft skills that lead you to be successful. So being organized, being disciplined, being self-motivated, right? So all of these things contribute to how you ultimately run your life, okay? So now I'm in a position where, um, okay, so, and one more thing, delegation and working with a team, okay? So in most of my businesses, especially ones I've set up, I'm not the top person. I'm not the best person. I've recruited people that are better than me. I've given away shares, given away equity to ensure that the people that are running the business like full time, they've got this. Okay. And I'm like learning from them. Yeah. Okay. And then I then take a smaller or peripheral role in the business. Okay. But you, that then involves management, recruitment, training, loads of things. So like my cousin, he's younger than me. Um, he was at Vodafone for nine years or so not really getting too far okay because of some because of him some because of the the culture of the company in egypt right and i brought him into my telecoms and it companies as my like right hand man i trained him up i delegated i gave him responsibility and now literally i just do a couple of bits of um you know of work with him during the week but he's mainly he's mainly running that i've sacrificed money shares everything right but what have i gained I was able to then focus on other businesses, mm. build other businesses, and I have peace of mind. I can go to sleep. I can turn my phone off, mm. right? Because he's got it, right? But you've got to sacrifice, right? Yeah? And you've got to train and all these different things. And delegation is a big, big challenge for, for people, especially successful people. They're control freaks. They're scared. You know, they're condescending. They don't want to just let other people have a chance. You know, my cousin made loads of mistakes, mm. right? But I keep telling him, because he feels obviously bad when he does those mistakes. But I said to him, listen, if you weren't running this business, there's no way I could have built the other things I've been building. Mm. And there's no way I'd be spending time with my mum like I have. And there's no way I'd be able to do all the traveling I'm doing. Right? So even if we almost wiped that business away now, we, but we accumulated so much else. So what point in your journey did you learn the importance of delegation? Literally from the first corporate telecom job that I got because um, I was trying to be a manager yeah. and sell so I had my own target and I was trying to be a team leader to become a manager you got to prove that you can do the job right and that is when I realized if I try and do everything myself it's not going to happen mm. okay so I had to start delegating to different people in the team different things and that's when I saw the rewards you free up time and another book one minute manager one minute manager. Yeah. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The One Minute Manager, and How to Win Friends and Influence People. Three key books that everyone needs to read. I remember after I finished my MBA, I pitched uh, uh, an idea to my strategy lecturer. And he said to me, he said, he said you have to remember the first thing you do is hire the person who can run the business for you. Mm. Yeah, I said, You should get it from the get-go. Yes. Hire the person that can run the business for you so that once the thing's moving, you can go and do whatever else you want yeah, to do. Yeah, exactly. And you've, you've reiterated on, the same thing. Spot on advice. And he was early 40s. He'd set up two or three like extremely successful companies in Sweden. And then he'd just been like, I think similar to your story in a way, I think he was just like, why am I here where it's cold and miserable and this, that, and, yeah. the other. and you're like, I've got all this money, flew down to Cape Town, spent a little bit of time here, liked it, 
bought himself a massive house on the beach in Komiki, which is kind of like on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then he would drive for 45 minutes once a week to come and lecture strategy at the business school. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's uh, fascinating. So we have this saying in the business now, in the American business, our CEO says, said this, and it was a brilliant comment. He said, we've got to think about how much time we're working in the business versus how much time we're working on the business. All right? Mm -hmm. And if you're spending too much time in the business, you're probably missing opportunities and not working very, very effectively. Whereas if you're working on the business and the top and at a strategic level, having a bullseye view and seeing where the problems are and where the opportunities are, you can drive the business forward a lot quicker. But if you're bogged down on day-to-day -day crap, which exists in every business, okay, you are losing that strategic element. Okay? And when you're in a startup, you have to do both. And at the start, you're going to be bogged down in the business most of the time. But that's why, again, you know, having a team around you and understanding all these theories and having mentors and experienced people that have done this before, they will force you. At least, you know, listen, spend three hours every Monday. Forget that, you know, turn your phone off, turn, you know, and just reflect on the business and mm. see what you see, how you can take this to the next level. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, man. Like so many, like a lot of the team are part time in the American business, okay? But like really senior people, and they just come in for like one conversation a week. Boom, they drop, just drop gold. When did you start that business? 2014. Well, wow. and now you are struggling to catch up with yourself. What do you mean? In the sense that it's expanding faster than you're able to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, and it's got immense potential, mm. global. Um, so I've never been in this situation before. And actually, neither have my team members. As much as I tried to over-engineer, yeah. but none of us have been in this position before. So it's a bit tricky, um, you know, knowing knowing what to do. And none of us have gone through COVID before, globally. Right. <laughs> so, like, you know, what, what do you do, man? What well, that's do? exciting. It's a, it's a nice challenge to have, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Man. Better than the other side. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, but listen, I have had those. Uh, I've had those problems before as well. So of we, I don't want to get you know philosophical and say you know cliches, whatever, right? But the failures, failures in life, man. I I don't see them as failures. They're lessons, right? So when when we when we got into my first business. Um, with the other guy. We built a sales team of eight and made like 200 grand in like six months. We were like flying, right? So we're like, okay, why don't we build a national sales team? And we went and spoke to some, you know, private investors, angel investors, friends, and we got investment and we went from eight salespeople to 40 in six months. Mm. Right, because we were like, okay, well, let's just duplicate the model. Yeah, have sales teams of eight all across the country. Boom, have five of them, and we got like startup money. Two months after that, I was doing um, redundancy meetings mm. where we got rid of thirty-five people. Right, so yeah. you were left with less than you started yeah. to do it. Yeah, and loads of debt. Uh. Right. So, you know, you got to learn new lessons and you got to grow at the right pace and blah, blah, blah. And, I mean, so without that lesson, there are many things that are done badly, right? Without those 20 no's or 19 no's in the, you know, in the perfume, I wouldn't have been, you know, wouldn't have become as good as I did in sales without those no's. So, you know, we say, don't judge me by how, how high I can jump, but judge me about how, with how high I can bounce back after falling mm. right the resilience they're talking about the, you know everyone's criticizing Everton now who are near the bottom of the table right because the minute they can see the goal all their heads drop and then they, they lose 4-0 like, where's the you know there's got to be resiliency in the team you've got to be able to like, take a knock and get up how many times have Liverpool conceded a goal and then they still win the game so you, you, you got to you got to have you have to go through problems to learn and they're not failures. It's only a failure if you quit. If you quit and you stop, class, that's it. Okay, for me, you've you've you failed. With a caveat, again. Right. I was going to just say, like, don't flog a dead horse. Yeah. 
yeah. but you get the general yeah, principle yeah, of what yeah. we say. No, there's because I think I've, I mean, you 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 referred to failures as lessons. I've had a lot of big lessons mm. throughout my journey of entrepreneurial mm. uh, expressions, you could say. And I think it's each one has hurt more than the one before because it's like you you're doing it. You're gonna this one's gonna this one's gonna happen, mm. and then it's like ah, oh, and it's like even more painful. It's like an even deeper dagger being mm. twisted. But I've kept going. And I've oh, and I've always, and I've kept trying new things. As even as soon as lockdown started, you know, I got my five, three, three friends together, mm. and we started like a hustle selling sanitizer and stuff. And we had it, it turned out that after the whole thing, we had exactly broken even. <laughs> so we hadn't lost anything. We'd been able to like pay for things throughout the throughout the year. Mm. But the most important thing of that was we were having such a ball. And mm. we were out and about. We had a we had a special permit so we could move around. Right. So when the whole country, I mean the whole world, was in lockdown, we were in our cars driving around on these empty roads, whatever time of day we wanted. And it was like we had such an amazing time. It was such. There was the. It was special, and it was. It was that. It was that kind of drive to try and do something. It didn't work, but. But don't underestimate the value of those uh, those lessons. Because they they all come into play at some at some stage. Well, that's what I was kind of reframing it in my head. Is like I've learned a lot of lessons. Mm. I also learned a very expensive, very 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 big lesson in Zimbabwe. <laughs> you know, did I had a very lucrative contract on the table with the army of Zimbabwe. Okay raised the money in order to fulfill the contract the, our contract was based on so we had to refurbish a vehicle we were introduced to the national to the zimbabwean national army via a family in zimbabwe you know a very prominent indian family that had connections with mugabe and and right. the, the top generals so they introduced us to the well, they saw the opportunity that these they had a whole load of vehicles that were just stuck in warehouses falling apart. Mm -hmm. And I was we were fixing military vehicles. So we teamed up with them. We flew up to Zimbabwe for like literally for the day, sat down with the guys in their offices and said, OK, come, let's do it. So we got in the car. We went to the barracks, checked out the vehicles, took a load of photos of them, mm -hmm. came back to Cape Town put together a plan of how we're going to fix these things up. Found a few of the mechanics I knew that had done work on these kind of vehicles back in the day. And we went back and, and pro proposed uh, this um, project to the army. They had, uh, I think it was 92 of these vehicles across the country. And they said, okay, awesome. Fix the one. If we like it, we'll give you the contract for the lot. Okay, cool. But you, but you fix it on your cost. It was okay, we did. So I hustled the money, I raised the money, asking this one, that one. So I was 25, mm -hmm. I think, hustled the money, got yeah. it all together. Yeah. And we went there and we shipped all the spare parts down and everything and we got there and we started fixing this thing. And we did it. We re the whole flipping turret. We got a special, a specialist, uh, like, arms guy mm. to come and re the barrel of the, the main cannon. We took it out into the Eastern Highlands and we were like firing this thing into the mountain, testing it, making sure everything was fine. And we did a complete and utter refurb on this vehicle. And it was like the, some, like the money just wasn't coming and they weren't paying and they weren't signing off on the thing. And then suddenly it just went quiet. And it turns out, I found out a year later that the family that we, that were, had, helped us and brokered the thing and whatever had registered a company in the same name in Zimbabwe and changed all the paperwork changed all the details and everything and taken the contract and taken our mechanics turns out my one of my mechanics is now driving a Ferrari in Pretoria oh my god <laughs> so they did they did it but uh that was a that was a hard knock but that was a very that was a amazing lesson okay but let's break this down mm. so what what positives did you did you take from that experience? So what what positives? 
could you share with other people because I've seen a few already mm. to that they could benefit from that that experience oh, so many I mean the more I go along like this this event that became this huge part of my life because it, in the beginning it was a big trauma you know like I'd mm. taken money from my parents I'd lost it taking money from friends I'd lost it you know and yeah. and I'd convinced them that like nah, this is like a huge opportunity yeah. just trust me and they trusted me so number one people trust me exactly that's a huge big thing yeah, yeah absolutely. number two I was in a in charge of an operation in a foreign country like just exploring I I had employees man <laughs> like at 25 I had employees it was amazing and not just like highly specialized mechanics and I'd put the team together I'd negotiated the contracts and stuff we did it which is huge like what I set out to achieve mm. we completed it mm. um I was dealing with a high level military figures yeah that's amazing exposure on your cv as well and networking yeah networking the story is dynamite mm. <laughs> yeah and what about like lessons learned I mean, lessons really infinite learned. lessons there infinite lessons i mean i'm still learning the lessons that i've learned and you know as in the, the lessons that i learned from that experience are still emerging you know okay like, as, <laughs> as i go along it's like there's the ones that are like very clear and in your face and there's other things that are kind of very like are deeper or below the surface and things but the biggest one was you know checks and balances from the get-go because we didn't especially in somewhere like africa where things can be it's the wild west you gotta you gotta be aware of who you're dealing with and what you're doing I think there was a naivety in the sense that the family we were dealing with, you know, we ate in their house, man. I helped at the son's wedding. I made food for the children. I looked after the children, you know, like I felt like I was just part of the family. Mm, mm. And they went and screwed me like mm. upside down. Yeah. And my thing was, is even that you, you, they knew that the first one was like, do, do the first one on your pocket. And then we'll give you the contract. Mm -hmm. like, At least just pay us for the first one, you know. Because mm -hmm. that, that was the knock, you know. Like, even if you don't get the contract and the, the, the thing going forward, mm -hmm. that was painful. Mm -hmm. That was really painful. So how does that affect your trust in people then, on a business level? How does that affect my trust in people? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I haven't reflected on it. Well, clearly that's a critical thing, right? So now if you entered a... a into an equivalent agreement or whatever, yeah. what are your expectations going to be of, of, of the possibilities? Is anything going to shock you? No, not in the human right. capacity. <laughs> After what you've seen now, nothing's going to shock you. No. Right? So now you're like prepared yeah. for the worst. Mm. Right? And then are you going to go around trusting anyone? No. Right. Okay. But trust is levels. So it's not, trust isn't some like black and white thing. Oh yeah, I 100% trust them or I don't. You build trust, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, you're not, you're not going to fully trust anyone because of what, what just happened, mm. right? So if you're not trusting people, I think that puts you in a more secure position. Because if you're behaving in accordance to, I'm not, I can't trust them, then what are you going to do? You're going to write contracts, you know, be really shrewd with it. You're going to, really take your time with making decisions, mm. your eyes are going to be dramatically more open than they would have before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Well, unless you went through that experience, you're not going to enter into the next relationship with, with those skill sets. Mm. So you have to go through that pain. Yeah, 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 fascinating. I'm a big fan of the Karate Kid film. Okay. Have you seen it? I think I did. There's wax on, wax off. No. Thank you. Right? If you don't do the wax on, wax off, how are you going to defend? How are you gonna... And he didn't know. Remember, he got frustrated. He's like, why am I doing this? I don't want to do wax on, wax off. Right? <laughs> I'm not here to clean cars. Right? But he cleans the cars, wax on, wax off. The next minute you know, he's winning a tournament and he suddenly did that in defense. Mm -hmm. So what we're getting taught then, you know what I mean, boom. Yeah. So this is your learning. This is our learning. Mate, what the hell do we do building up to uni 
and then at uni if you wanted to be a doctor tell me what a doctor goes to if you want to be a doctor what do you do you study you study you study you study you go in the you apprentice you yeah like you years do, right you do your time yeah and nothing but studying yeah right so you you do your whatever normal like GCSEs, A levels, whatever it is, and then three, four years condensed at uni, and then for a doctor, there's a whole load more after that. Yeah. And you know, um, the apprentice shadowing, blah blah, all that right. stuff. Right. Okay. Cool. So why is it that when it comes to running a business, that somehow we expect that you've done nothing to do with running a business before, and you can just suddenly jump in and learn how to run a business successfully, and mm. not learn, so jump in and run a business successfully? Why does why that, that expectation exist? I have no idea. Right? So, you, you know, you said to me earlier, I've had a load of experiences, each one after the other, right? With all due respect, if I probably put that into time, probably doesn't even equate to three years at uni studying engineering. This is condensed. Like, you've done nothing but study engineering for three or four years. And before that, you've had 10 years of school mm. to get to that point, right? So, the odd few hours, whatever, a couple of years of learning some some business issues nothing man it's n near zero experience the other thing i like is um is doing something at the age of 25 okay because what happens what's the normal standard life of, a, of any person globally now what's the, the get a job exactly and then what happens so when he's like 30 takes out a mortgage cool all right and how is he generally in life and what's like is he married? You got kids? Yeah, married, two kids, half yeah. a car. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Okay, now why doesn't that guy go and run a business? Why? Mm. Because he can't. He's, <sighs> he's got a wife and kid to feed and... Exactly, too much risk. And mortgage repayments and... Exactly. Credit card repayments, etc., etc. Exactly. So then he just goes through the rest of his life in that job, maybe he gets promoted, and that's his life. Yeah. A bit of debt, and then he's literally just focused on trying to raise his kids. Can't really do much more outside of that. Got no work-life balance. Okay, Ukraine war happens, flipping the cost of petrol has gone up. You know I mean, COVID's happened. I can't do anything. You know, what I mean? like it's just a really bad life. It's too late, mm. and he's just literally in survival mode. He just needs to get any job. He doesn't have any skill set or understanding of running a business, yeah. so he can't even consider that. So he, it's just a dead end. Right? And then we wonder why people are getting drunk, they're on drugs, watching <laughs> film, you know, I mean, escapism galore. Because, like, what is the hope? Yeah. Right? That's the life today. Right? So, if you start doing all that stuff when you've got no responsibility, right? And, the, okay, you, you've lost some, your parents some money, whatever, right? But, hey, we've all, we've all done that. Okay? <laughs> and it's part of their investment, right? And the journey's not over. You're still whatever, 33, whatever it is, you know? You still haven't really matured. You know, you need to look at, um, the prophetic traditions, I think all prophets, there isn't a prophet that became a prophet until the age of 40. Yeah, no, 40 is the, is the start, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you, you, you haven't even, you're still a kid. I know. Really. <laughs> it's huh? lovely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, and, and also, let's talk about another problem, big, big, big problem in society, right? Um, comfort zone and conformism. Mm, right? Two big themes that have emerged from this yeah. journey. So let's just do the same as everyone else, right? And I'm scared to do anything else. Mm. I'm just happy in my zone, right? I met someone the other day, right? Um, at the, I'm going to plug their company here, Nude Foods, oh, right? Yes. It's a zero waste shop, yeah. right? So we should all promote zero waste uh, grocery shopping. Okay, so you have to take your container and then put the beans in or whatever, no, no plastic, right? So I met this guy there, I was chatting to him, and he wants to know a bit more about Islam, okay? So I arranged to meet with him for lunch. First question, he goes, um, he goes, so if I become Muslim, will I find comfort? I want comfort. <laughs> said, how can I find comfort? So my response to him was like, he was shocked. Yeah. I said to him, bro, why the hell do you want comfort for? He's like, he didn't, he, he couldn't comprehend 
the question. So I asked him the same thing again. So why do you want comfort? Right? And he just couldn't get it. I said to him, bro, what are you into, like sport or whatever? You know, I think he was into like bodybuilding. I said, what happens? What have you read about people that are stuck being comfortable? He's like, yeah. No, you're right, because if you win a tournament or whatever, and you get comfortable, then the next man's going to come along and he's going to win. You're not, you're not going to win again. Yeah. Right? I said, okay, cool. What have you seen in anything, you know, personal, spiritual, whatever, when people get comfortable, what happens? And suddenly his eyes started to, to open. He's like, yeah, they don't progress, there's no development, blah, blah, blah. And I said, not only that, right? Like, let's say, because, you, you know, you want to talk about it from a spiritual perspective or whatever, a behavioral perspective. If you're comfortable with how you are as a person, what the hell does that say about your, you know, your evolvement and development in life? And, I mean, and that could lead to arrogance, you know? Like, yeah, I'm comfortable with how I am. Oh, really? So you're perfect now. You've reached a state of perfection, mm. right? Because I'm, I'm either, there's some things that I'm good at, I'm doing well, and there's other things that I need to improve on. But even the things I'm doing well, I can try and do better, mm. right? I, st- I can still try and improve them, right? Or do more of it or whatever. So being comfortable is the worst, is the worst thing you want to be in. Like that, don't go there. Uh, 100%. <laughs> right? Okay? And then I explained to him, you know what I mean? Like Islam is all about migration. Most religions, you know, Buddhism, whatever, you're migrating from where you are to where you need to get to, right? That development, that process, physically migrating. You know, why are we just sitting in the same country? Who, who said that? Why do we just live in the same country? Why aren't you traveling? Why are we all traveling? Why do people want to stay in one place? Because I, I mean, look, I grew up in, I was born in Leeds, grew up my first few years in Oxford. Then my father moved to Scotland and we grew up in Scotland. Then we came out to Cape Town and yeah, I spent some time, well, this whole Zimbabwe mission. I was living in Zimbabwe for a year, basically. Spent a few months in Australia now, a couple of years just before lockdown. And I can't imagine why somebody would want to live in the same place. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little story, right? So in the early 1800s, there was a serious war between France and Prussia. Prussia is now Germany, right? Um, and Prussia got destroyed. Like they lost the war big time. Mm. Okay. So they, um, they're like, okay, how are we going to sort this out so we don't get beat again? So they say, oh, we need two things. We need money, right? And we need a good army. Yeah. Right? This was like at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Okay? So they're like, okay. <clears throat> what we're going to do is we need to produce soldiers and factory workers. Okay? This is no joke. The story I'm telling you, this is reality. Right? So we need to produce factory workers and soldiers. How are we going to do that? Guess what they invented? Guess what they invented? I don't know. The current education system. School. I'm not joking. Okay? This is how school was invented. The modern education system, okay, was invented to breed factory workers and soldiers. Okay? People that are dumbed down that don't have the ability to critically think, right? That will just do what they're told and they're skilled enough to do the job that they need to do and to fill in their tax returns and pay money, okay? Um, They don't want thinkers. They don't want creativity because that's going to cause problems. They don't want people with ambition. They want dumbed down, non-critically thinking slaves, basically. 100%. Okay? You can't, they say you can't have an intelligent soldier. Because the minute he knows what he's fighting for, he's going to leave. No, it's not, this isn't mm. a just thing. Right? So, there are many videos about this. This stuff is taught in Harvard. So, it's not even a joke. Right? This isn't a secret. It's not like a conspiracy theory. Yeah. This is reality. This is fact. Yeah. Okay? These are the aims of the modern education system. Okay? And we're all just economic slaves, corporate slaves under the current financial system. Right? These guys are at the top, they run the corporate, they need people to work in the corporates to deliver the mass money they need, 
right? So they need people that are just going to be happy to stay in one place and just keep doing the same job and not have too much ambition, right? That starts with the education system, right? And then from there, you can do more and more doctrination when they're in school to try and make them consumers, to try and make them have an iPhone 4 that works perfectly well, but then you show them an ad for iPhone 5, and they're like, oh, I need that, right? This is all part of that doctrination, part of the, the setup of the system. Then you add in some other things, right? Um, the financial system, which is, the, for me, the, the head of the snake, right? So this is crippling. So even if you want to do something else, you physically can't afford to do it, right? So you, you need to take them to school, because you think that's what you're supposed to do, take them to school, that's what everyone's doing. You need to buy a car, you need to have a house, they get you the mortgage, right? So you're basically crippled. You can't, you're, you're literally enslaved. You have a lasso around your neck, the mortgage. For 25 years, mm. you've got this thing that you're trying to like, you know, shut down. And if you don't, you're going to lose your house and that's your main protection and safety. Mm. Okay. So they have you basically by the balls, excuse my language, right? You can't do anything, even if you wanted to. The, the money you earn isn't enough for freedom. Okay. And then they put all these other circumstances in place. Right. And then alongside all that, the other sort of punches they hit you, the jabs, are the distraction, films, music, alcohol, blah, 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 all these things that keep you, keep you dumbed down and not critically thinking, right? So you're squeezed, you're squeezed, and if you start reflecting, it'd be too depressing for you, and then, okay, you know what, Liverpool game's on now, so we'll just watch that and just figure out about everything, just mm. get a bit of temporary, temporary pleasure, balloon, balloon pleasure, you know, explodes in a second, it's gone. So... The whole system is built and designed to keep us down, to keep the poor poor and poor and getting poorer and keep this little echelon of rich people richer. And they're the ones that control the world. Whatever you want to label them as, right? But that's my sort of world view on what's happening and why we're in this state and how they're able to get the majority of people to literally be enslaved, um, doctrinated, and just believing whatever we are told and doing whatever these people want them to do. So my question to you mm. is how do you, how do you envisage popping that bubble? I don't. Honestly, I don't. <laughs> so how do you envisage a better future? For or what are you trying to do to do something? So my, my view is that I'm not placed in this world to solve global problems. Right. Okay. My understanding through the, through the Quran is I've got to sort myself out and then my family and my kids and then whoever else I, I come into contact with. The global situation is a circumstance that is beyond my control. It's not on my sphere of um, control. So it's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I just have to do the best I can to be a better human being myself and then my family and anyone I touch, right? Now, I'm trying to do things on a, on a bigger scale, mm -hmm. okay? Like the food project we have, the single origin and helping farmers and all the stuff that we do, it's fine. But ultimately, I can't influence a system. There's a system in place, a financial system, which is based on interest, um, which doesn't have a gold standard, and that is the main controlling thing, right? So I can't, unless we try and change that system, Everything else is, is, is irrelevant. And it's not in my personal power to change that system. But that system is in free fall. That system cannot maintain itself for, in free for fall eternity. For Sorry? In free fall for who? In free fall for the people who are in control of it. Really? What, they're not rich? Yes, they're rich. But is Mark Zuckerberg, whatever his name is, is right. he stressed about what's going on? And Elon Musk and all these people? Not in the same way, but he... My point is, is that that system will eventually have to come crumbling in on itself because of the way, I mean, you mentioned interest in usury mm -hmm. and the way it's, the way it's being created, which started in the 1600s with fractional reserve banking and, and, you know, with the goldsmiths, etc. Mm -hmm. But they, I mean, every time there's some kind of crack in the system and you're like, oh, you know, 2008 financial crash or whatever it is then they come up with all this financial engineering to keep the thing like kind of the bubble going then you see 
you know, as the things. I don't want to get caught on conspiracy theory or this that, and the other, but I mean, like COVID was a very good way of keeping everybody at home while they tried yeah. to like yeah. fiddle about. And then you've got, um, you know, like the rise of cryptocurrency and all of these things and just increasing the number of currency, money supply, whatever you want, M1, M2, M3, whatever it is, that's just increasing so that this bubble can keep going with all of this debt and all of this increase and all of this usury and all of like it, it is unsustainable at some point it has to explode in implode in on itself right and my thing is is that you cannot like you were saying you cannot fight against this leviathan but you can create something new and maybe you created something new in the tiny little corner of the globe with a few people that are of the same ilk and the same thought process but that can grow and that can become something else. I mean, I, my, you remember you mentioned the Quran and being Muslim. And I look back to the example of Medina, which was, it was a small city, a small grouping of people that were loyal to the Prophet Sallallahu and understood the, what he had come to bring. And from that, look what happened. The, the, they didn't, I don't think they were going out to change the world. But the first three, four, five generations changed the world <laughs> for 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 you know, whether that was their core intention or not. Hmm. Agreed, man. Agreed. And I don't have any issue with believing that someone, that one man can make a change. I'm hmm. cool with that philosophy, that attitude. I don't have that on the answer. That's cool. No, I was just curious, like, given everything that you've said, do you have any, like, are you plotting some solution or, or, or but, but I think what you said was actually was spot on is that you do what you can, you do the work on yourself. And that naturally will have an impact on your wife, your children, your family, your close family, whatever, and everyone that you come, come in contact with. Because that's all you can actually, that is all that you can do. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Another thing that really inspired me is a film called Zeitgeist, or a documentary called Zeitgeist, the movie. We're, again, one of the, there's books in that film. People need to watch that. Um, and in Zeitgeist, they actually um, bring people on what, who they call the economic hitmen. Mm. So these are people that work for the various governments, whatever, that in essence, um, when anyone gets out of line, they take him out. Yeah. <laughs> right? And they even talked about the whole process that they go through um, in, in taking a, 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 a president or a country out. It's a whole process. I've yeah. forgotten it so much now. I haven't seen it for a little while, but there's a whole process they go through, like um, military intervention or assassination or whatever as a whole. Yeah. Thing. So they actually get the people that actually committed the crimes. They come and do the interview. And they tell you, yeah, this is what we did in Iran, yeah, there's, um, the Shah. Um, what's his name? I've forgotten his name. The guy that he wrote a book, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Yeah, that's like John something or other. Yeah, he's one of the people in, that, in, in, the, in the film. Right. Now, he is a fascinating man. Mm. Because he, after doing all of this work, screwing over governments and crippling, mm. he was... I guess he was broken from it and he went in search of knowledge and he went on a number of journeys to the Amazon rainforest to learn from the people in the kind of, that have had as little contact with the Western world as possible. Right. And he was doing all of this work with the shamans there. And he basically, the one shaman, he, 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 he had this kind of epiphany and he, and he learned from these people so much that he was like, I want to share this with my people back home. Right. Like, how can I do it? Okay. And he said, you can't do it, but you can bring a select few people that you choose from America and bring them here for me to teach them. And so he did it. Oh, wow. And he wrote, and he, he got like these top medical professionals. And, the, and he wrote this book on dreams. And it's all about his experiences bringing these people to the Amazon rainforest 
I think he was in Peru, some part in the north of Peru with these like ancient shamanic people and these top-notch doc doctors being cured by this kind of traditional healer who uses no medicines or whatever. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's also ayahuasca trip and there's a, there's another element to it, but it's a fascinating book. I, I highly recommend reading that. Yeah. No, no, because no, no. he's always saying that. And the, one of the things that really struck me from it was that everything that's in your past is a dream because it's not in the present. And everything in the future, you, I mean, you, you have your dream future, you dream this, whatever, whatever. It's a, that's also a, uh, it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's a dream, it's a facade, it's an idea, it's a concept. And he says that you can change your dream in the moment, you can change your past and you can change your future. Mm, and mm. it's and it happens in the moment mm, mm. and there's a lot of a lot of beautiful things that that happens okay now i've got to check his book man. because it was me. also it was like you were saying to me about my experience in zimbabwe and like i'd seen it as this great trauma for for a long time and i mean again you reiterated the thing is that well, what did you learn from it what were the mm. lessons because it you know, and then you can go back to that memory and you can change the memory. Mm. And in changing that past memory, you're changing your, your present. And I think that's very yeah. much present with the kind of ancestral conditioning that we all have from our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents and everything that they went through. I mean, we carry it, but you can do the work and look back and go back and you can heal that. So you're healing your past so yeah. that your present, you can move forward in a full state. Absolutely, absolutely. The other thing as well is you, you. There's two kind of parts to, in my view, every experience you go through. There's um, what you've got to do to gain from it. So the learn, you know, what you learn from it, and then how you're going to move forward. Okay, and then there's the acceptance of it, because when you go through a bad experience it can be difficult to accept and is that why did it happen to me or why did it happen all these different things right but part of the acceptance um comes from again you know within the islamic understandings when you um do a supplication to god one of the ways that god um accepts your um your your supplication is he he might not give you what you ask for but he will remove a calamity from you mm. right okay so you don't know what could have happened in that situation or any one of your what you perceive as your negative situations yeah. if they would have gone through, right? Yeah. Like if you'd have got that contract, maybe your life would have been in danger. Maybe your kids would have got killed or kidnapped, right? You don't know, man. Yeah. You don't know. So this is where you've got to be like, if I, I honestly do trust in God, fine, this is what God meant for me. Yeah. It's all good. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I need to learn from it and get better. I have to stress that. Right, but you accept it because God knows best, yeah. and you don't know what could have lied ahead for you. Yeah. Right, and I'll tell you something about money, yeah, because um, this guy again that I met from Nude Foods, right, um, he comes from a very very poor background. The guy came from Malawi and was living in a tin tin hut, whatever, in one of these places. But funny thing, he ha they have to pay rent for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They pay rent to live in that crazy. Anyway, um, so. Obviously, his whole perspective is about poverty and poverty is not a good thing, blah, 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 blah. So I said, mate, everyone's gotten, everyone is in a test. Don't you think rich people are also being tested? And his eyes are open, like, yeah, man. What do you think happens to rich people? What, what are you seeing from rich people now? Druggies, alcoholics, committing suicide, blah, 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 blah. Everyone's got a test. I'm actually scared of having too much money. Yeah. I'm really scared of if I have fame. Like, what if I suddenly became really, really famous, man? I'm really scared what happens. Yeah. Arrogance, women, whatever, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Right? So, to be successful in a worldly way also has its consequences and its challenges. Right? So, it's, you know, we're obviously all driven to try and, you know, do a good deal or, you know, build a big business and make money, of course. Right? But who said that's the definition of success? Well, exactly. Well, how do you, because success itself is a label. Yeah. So, you know, what's your perception of success yeah. as opposed to mine or you, somebody else's? Or what 
other people have told us success is. Exactly. Which is what it tends to be most of the time, right? Mm. Right? Because people don't even necessarily want to accept your definition of success. Right. It's funny because I didn't go to university. Oh, well done. <laughs> I, I left school again. I got four A's in my A-levels. Right. Straight A GCSEs. And I came out here and my sheikh told me to stay in Cape Town. So I had my... my um, uh, I had my I had a place at London School of Economics. Really? And so wow. has... that's a big sacrifice, man. But it wasn't a sacrifice. Uh, generically, but yeah, yeah that's my like, point. I mean, like in that, but in that moment, it wasn't. It was like because I'd already fallen in love with Cape Town. Mm. I was already like suddenly, you know, the eighteen-year-old on the other side of the world. Nobody knows me here. Like, okay, some people know my parents or whatever, but nobody knows me. Like mm. in the street, like. I can be whoever I want to be. And I did. I played a number of different roles when I first came here. I was mm. like, okay, you know, you meet somebody in the club and you just pretend to be somebody that you're not. And you <laughs> da, 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 and you'd have these little um, kind of pocket adventures with different people. And I met these guys from Johannesburg and mm. was partying with them one summer. And it, there was, it was like, there was so much freedom in it. I mean, I literally, it was two weeks after I left school came out to South Africa and I was free. I was like, wow. Yeah. And then my sheikh asked me to stay and I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's I stayed. Liberating, right? Yeah, man. And I mean, and again, like how many adventures and things in Zimbabwe and this other thing and that thing and blah, 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 blah. It all came from that one decision to stay. And I stayed and wow. The other thing is, is you might end up giving one piece of advice to someone because of all those experiences, culmination of all those experiences, or even just one of those experiences. Mm. But you might end up giving one piece of critical advice yeah. to a person where you save his life, transform his life, save his life. Mm. Right? So you don't know. You don't know. Right? But that's why it's all about your attitude and your outlook towards it. Everything about the glasses you look at life through and you look at your experiences through. That's the key thing. And the more you realize you don't know, Actually, the more like calm you should be. You don't know. You don't know what evil was out there. Well, that's the thing, isn't right? it? And you don't know what good is going to come of it in the future. So be cool with it, but constantly evolve, try and develop, try and improve, be a better person, blah, blah, blah. That's it. And then you should have a balanced reaction to anything that happens in your life, whether it's good or bad, because don't over-celebrate, right? And who said it's good? Yeah. If I have too much money now, maybe that causes me harm. I lose my balance, I lose my modesty, my humility, whatever, right? So don't over-celebrate, don't get over-excited, and don't get, you know, overly unhappy. Just keep it balanced. Keep it balanced, but that's it, isn't it? Balance. You just got to keep everything balanced. Yeah. Why well, is one thing that I, the one hadith that I just absolutely love, is that the Prophet Sallallahu never too. went to sleep with with anything like any like money right he'd always make sure that it was given if if he would use whatever was needed to be used hmm. and then whatever else was given away right so that he would always go to sleep on zero right. so that the next day wow. you know you, you you see where the 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 the, the, the hmm. provision comes from is i think the, the i would actually understand that under the, the meaning of that as um your insurance policy is with Allah. Mm. It's not with the creation. Yeah. You don't need to put your money in some fund, you know. Yeah, yeah, but there's so many different factors to that because we believe that it, for you know whatever pound or whatever you give in charity, you get it ten times back, right? So he, he he's the prophet Peter of him There, he's he's done his investment. You know what I mean? He did. He just did an investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's fully believing he's going to get Tam Tam back. That's the proper, true, you know, trust in God. Right? How many of us have that? Have that <laughs> conviction, right? <laughs> Everyone's worried about how much savings are in their account. You want to give away your savings, you know? Yeah. What? You want me to go to sleep? What? Like with nothing? Not knowing what's going to come tomorrow. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Are you mad? <laughs> yeah. We're, mad we're, we're bred against that. Like, that's what you don't do. 100%. But you know what? That's another thing with the whole digital nomad thing. Yeah, is letting go of all my stuff. 
Right. Like I literally, I've got, I'm down to that one suitcase now. Oh, wonderful. Right. And I'm telling you, I got rid of so much, so many chains. You know, I used to love my plasma screen and, you know, my, my red leather sofa, whatever, from wherever I got it from. I mean, you detach this life of a nomad moving one place to the next and you don't know where you're going to go next. Puts you in a completely different mindset. Right. Right. And it, it's liberating. Yeah. It is liberating. You're not worried about all your clothes anymore. My, I've got to have, you know, I've got one jacket for the night time, this jacket for that outing. No, so that's it. I've got this suitcase. If I need something, worst case, I'll just go and buy it today. Right. Not everything's going to color match. <laughs> right. So be it. You know what I mean? Um, friends. I'm not, I I'm not attached to friends now. Like I've got loads of friends, but it's not like I'm seeing the same guy every day and he's my, he, you know what I mean? Now yeah. like, I've got to make new friends tomorrow. Yeah. Go make new friends, right? Which can be scary. Yeah. But then look, you and I have only met. We've met, what, two hours before? Now we're having a three, four hour conversation. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll be, we'll be, you know, best of friends, right? So you, there's, there's excitement for the future. I'm not holding on to the past. I'm not holding on to my comfort zone, right? The whole concept of I've got to have a house. And that's what, no. Yeah, fascinating. You are your house. So what do you say to somebody who doesn't have the income streams that you have to allow you to be a digital nomad? Planning. Setting goals and planning. Remember I said to you, I didn't just yeah. get up and leave. No, I said, all right, I'm going to start a business that allows me to manage it remotely and earns me enough money that with that, you know, like a thousand sterling in England is nothing. Yeah. A thousand sterling in Egypt, you're living like a king. Yeah. Right? So planning, research. Yeah? So you can see what you can, you know, how could I do it? Could, could I get a job somewhere else? Could I do this job in England, but do it in Mauritania remotely, save some money, okay? And then with the money saved, I can do X, Y, Z. There has to be planning. It's, there's no magic formula, man. right? But you have to have the intent. You have to have the, the goal. And then you research around it right and what i say to people is there are objectives but there are also parameters people miss the parameters bit so what do i mean by parameters for example one of my parameters my wife and i is to follow the sun we don't we don't do winters anymore okay oh yeah, okay yeah, yeah right so we just where the sun is okay so that's a parameter right um another parameter might be like i want to be in english-speaking countries for example right yeah okay um you know the the sterling whatever gets you whatever whatever the the parameters are right i want to be within a five hour flight of mum mm. okay so a lot of people for example in egypt don't go to america or australia they stay they stay in europe so they can be in close proximity mm. to to egypt one flight away four hours it's all good someone dies or someone's got a medical condition yeah boom. you can be there yeah so parameters is a really really key thing you set parameters find the objectives research execute and don't be scared and do it quick and do it early man that's you know what i mean do it before you've got kids do it with kids do it mate uh, listen um so what's the alternative to school a version of homeschooling but homeschooling doesn't mean what people think you just sit in a home and no there's community schooling right but i know people are world schooling 100 percent. right and you should see their kids man one of them has got vegan chef kids and they're like eight years old and the kid's like, I'm, when, I, when they speak, I sit down and bring out a pen and pad. I'm like, okay, yeah, go on. Yeah, I'm learning. No, I, I tell you, it's like <laughs> the idea that your kids being in a school, they're learning in this age is, is a fallacy. Mm. It's, but even, but I mean, that comes back to the whole subject of education. Is yeah. like, What is education? Yeah. Because going to school... And I went to the, one of the very best schools in Scotland. Right. And I think my, my period at school was probably the, 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 towards the last of real education that's left. Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was talking about it the other day. Was it with you when I was dumped on an island? I wasn't talking to you. No. So I, when I was 11, I went on a school camp. Right? It, was, it was a kind of... Um, it was a. It was in the holidays, and you had to apply for it, and then your parents had to pay for it. It was like outside of school, but okay. the school facilitated it. Right. 
And we were literally driven from Edinburgh, where my school was, up into the Hebrides, like past Oban and into the into the Hebrides, right? Which had like, these group of islands in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's like storms there and it's just mm. like wild. And I remember we had to take a number of ferries to get to this one island and then eventually we got off the off the out of the vehicle and onto another boat that took us to the island that we were going to be staying wow. in this place called Ruofiola, right? And it was like one of these kind of um uh it was a small little island with a hut in the middle, a big kind of building in the middle, and we stayed there, we were fed there, and during the period of two weeks we were taught all of these survival skills, right. right? And the culmination of these two weeks on this island was that you were taken in a boat and dumped on another island, right? With your friend, a mess tin, a box of matches, and a flare gun oh as an, for an emergency. <laughs> and like literally, good luck, here you go. 11 years old. That's crazy. That's it brilliant. mad. But right. And so we like we rocked up there, and we be, but in those two weeks we'd been taught everything that you need to survive mm. in this environment. So we've been taught how to look for, look for uh, fresh water and how the stagnant moss, stagnant moss. If you squeeze it, water comes out of it, and and that's, that, that's good right. drinking water. Yeah. So we were told what's good drinking water, what's mm. bad drinking water. Mm. Told mm. what you can eat that's around this area, mussels and this that and the other, and what's not. So we had our mess in. I remember me and my mate. We like the, we just grabbed so many mussels off the edge of the rocks that are in the ocean. Now you can imagine how fresh these are. Yeah. We put them in our mess tin, and we were literally just like cooking mussels and chowing them, yeah. and then putting it back into the you know picking up more and putting it on our little fire and chowing. Yeah. Them. We were Eleven years amazing. old, man, complete freedom. That's amazing. Like no parents, no friends, no mm -hmm. nothing. Just you and your one friend that you chose, mm -hmm. and that was the culmination of this two week trip. That's crazy. And that was just like facilitated by my school. I travelled to India to trek in the Himalayas through my school funded mm -hmm. by the British Army. Right. I was like, I remember I found a picture now of my shooting from school when I was 11. No, when I was 2000, yeah, I was 11. And it was like, I had like a like marksman shot. I was like, what the 25 meters, 11 years old. And it's like my, my grouping was like within a centimeter. And this is all stuff that I did at school. We just did it at school. Mm. And I'm constantly mm. thinking of all these different things. Mm. And I can assure you, for me, that my education from school was 10% the academic stuff, 90% mm. everything else. Yeah. The camaraderie, the being with young men, going through that weird time mm. of adolescence together, mm. you know, mm. playing rugby, mm. sports, you know, everything that happened, ex everything extracurricular that happened Yeah, yeah, absolutely. School, yeah. absolutely. That was, that was the learning. Yeah, 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 yeah we absolutely. Used take, we used to make like, um, bicycle jumps and stuff and like in the afternoons take our bicycles and jump through the forest mm. and break our arms and yeah. you know come crawling back to the matron <laughs> but you see a lot of these things that you, you're talking about there will have contributed to you having the mindset and the attitude to not go to university 100%. right to be entrepreneurial to look for a deal to hustle to travel all these things right mm. so you can't underrate the the influence that that education or the school the the environment the schooling environment that you went to has on, on forming your character and then your attitude what you do that's my before. thing about education and i think that the key to the future i mean you're talking about how you know two or three hundred years ago this schooling system was set up and it was created to to create a certain type of human mm. And I feel that, I mean, I've been doing this journey for a year now and I've been asking similar questions to lots of different people. And I really do feel that the, the way forward is at an educative level. It's that you've got to, and you and like you were saying, you're one man, you can't change the world. You know, it's like the system is huge. The system mm -hmm. is, is a Leviathan. You can't fight it. Yeah. They'll just take you out for breakfast. Yeah. But you can educate, you can teach, and you can teach a different way of of thinking, and that, like you said again, like that may change somebody's life. Mm. And if you keep doing that, maybe the next generation can continue that and take it even further. Yeah. And the next generation 
further yeah. and, and that time by that time three generations later maybe the human being is thinks different yeah and there's more there's a a, a serious yeah. grouping of people that think differently yeah and hopefully that we'll get our reward for doing a little part towards it but you actually answered the question the main way in my view that you're going to address the problem is to breed in you know people that have the ability to critically think not stuck in a comfort zone that can take action right so this is a generational thing through a better system of education and, and, and breeding you know upbringing thank you for listening to this episode of the new nomos podcast so many topics and themes were touched on in this episode so it's difficult to bring it all together in a nice and concise conclusion so I'm just going to say that I'm so grateful for having met Muhammad al Khatib, and in particular for this conversation, which once again came at exactly the right time. I gained huge value from this conversation and I've been putting it into practice and there's lots of things coming soon. So stay tuned and we'll be back soon with more from the New Nomos podcast. Thank you.